kind of diagram, you have any kind of exponentials, how do you deal with it? Exponentially distributed with parameter lambda. <clears throat> Do you have labels for <clears throat> Well, no, because I wouldn't have since they all have the same parameter lambda. If they had parameters lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four, that would I would need labels then. Okay. But so I'm just going to avoid the labels by uh, putting a big constant lambda of uh, lifetimes. So what is, and uh, so I think the basic thing is to um, break the thing down, right? Into basic pieces. The basic piece, I mean, the basic outside piece. From the outside in, you have a series connection, right? Of a kind of more complicated component and a simple, simple one, right? Yes. Okay. So if I if I could call, so if I was going to make some more notation, I could call um, T1, T2. I could call T1. Okay, Z1 then. Z1, the lifetime of this. Okay, lifetime. And I can call Z2 the lifetime of this. Lifetime of the system, the subsystem. Okay. And so, um, so maybe I could find the, um, so now I want to find the, basically to find the uh, density or distribution function of these lifetimes. So what I, I'm going to work on Z2 first because that's harder, right? Yeah. So what's the distribution function of the lifetime of Z2? It's the parallel. So F sub Z2, so F sub 2, so 2, let's say, equals the distribution function, S sub Z2, well, you might as well call it Z. You started with Z, G, right? <laughs> okay. So we'll do that. S, the distribution function. of lifetime of Z2. Let's see if we can get kind of a general program how to do this problem. Okay? Let's see if we can follow this. Okay, and then I would have F1. We know what F1 of Z is. F1 of Z would be distribution function of lifetime of Z2. What would that be? What is F1? What's the distribution function? Just the distribution. Yeah, okay, distribution function, which is 1, one minus e to the minus lambda z, right? z greater than 0. Okay. So you do have to memorize that part, <laughs> okay, to know what that is. All right. So now, let's take this little piece of the car then. What about this? How do I find the lifetime? Actually, this was the one that was on the test. Right? <laughs> okay. That doesn't look that hard. Uh, but how do you do Z2 then? 
How do you find the distribution function? It's parallel. Answer. What kind of parallel is there? And one of the parallels is series. So um, if I now broke down, so Z2, it turns out, is now the maximum. Now I'm going to bring in other letters, T1 and T2. Where this is the T1 is the lifetime of this component, component lifetime. And T2 is this series, there's another subsystem lifetime. So I'm going to keep bringing in other letters. Okay, T2 equals this subsystem lifetime. Now, what do you know about something in series? What do you know about the subsystem lifetime? Um, the bottom fails, it fails. It fails. So what it turns out for exponential random variable is that you can think of it this way. This fails at rate lambda. This one fails at rate lambda independently. Together, the subsystem fails at rate 2 lambda. Okay? It's failing twice as fast. Okay? Because basically each one is flipping a coin. Okay? You can think of it that way. Flipping a coin in. Um, you can think of an exponential random variable. Didn't we talk about that a little bit? It's all like a geometric random variable. You're waiting until the coin comes up heads. Only for an exponential, I didn't talk about it, I don't think, in this class. But uh, I didn't. The geometric random variable is like a discrete version of the exponential random variable. And so what you can actually show is that with the appropriate scaling, n go to infinity, p go to zero, with n p goes to lambda, as in the Poisson approximation. The exponential random variable, which is, and now you're tossing coins every nanosecond in order to get a whole bunch of tosses in one unit of time, okay? Because, all right, because n is going to correspond to the time. The large n the number of flips is going to correspond to a unit of time. So that means you have to flip the coins very often, okay? Okay. Now, and then the time, waiting time to play is just until you get ahead. Percent of head, where the probability of heads is very small, that a very small parameter p. So uh, that's the exponential weight of time. Now this one is flipping also. Well, okay. It's, it's as if you're flipping twice as often though, right? So your parameter is going up to two lambda instead of one. That's, that's just the exponential with parameter two. Right. So t two is uh, exponential with parameter two lambda. Okay, that's the thing. And the formal proof is that the probability that the survival probability, I think we did it was the T2 bigger than T, was the probability that the minimum of two exponential times, I call it not even another name, um, but anyway, X1 and X2, let's say. Minimum of X1 and X2. Yeah. Bigger than T. I'm going to look at the survival probability. Is that okay? Al, is that what your question? Was your question? No. I think it's G. Oh, T. okay. That's bigger than T. So that would be where well, this is the individual lifetimes, X1 and X2. Okay? Which would be with the time to tell heads. So, okay, the minimum is bigger than T if and only if both of them are bigger than T. This is the problem. That was the trick that we kept using over and over and over, trying to drive into your heads. Okay, trying to get this model of, you know, and it's supposed to make it consistent with this model of flipping coins. Okay, so this was bigger than, and which is then e to the minus lambda t is a product of probabilities, e to the minus lambda t, because that's the survival probability of a single exponential, e to the minus lambda t. So that gives e to the minus two lambda t, so the survival probability. What about the um Lambda Okay, the thing is, with survival probability is just e to the minus lambda t. This is a probability, not the density. Oh. So the density, this is the way often they work with exponential random variables. This makes the computation shorter. Infra? That's with yeah, the cumulative good. distribution function, that's with the less than or equal to t. Less? Yeah, so I'm saying the survival probability for the minimum of two exponentials is, is the simplest computation. 
Okay. Survival probability is just the e to the minus lambda t. The cumulative distribution function is 1 minus e to the minus lambda t, and the density is lambda e to the minus lambda t. So I'm here working here with the survival probability. Okay, so that's the key thing. When you have two exponentials, and if they were exponentials of different rates, lambda 1 and lambda 2, you would just add the rates. So if I had a lambda 1 and a lambda 2, I'd just put lambda 1 and lambda 2 here, and that would give me lambda 1 plus lambda 2 here instead of the 2 lambda. Mm -hmm. All right? That's very useful when you know how to deal with the, the minimum of two exponentials. Okay? Now this is not, this is, social system lifetime is not going to be exponential, unfortunately. We're not going to be able to use that trick in the final answer. Okay. But, um, let's see. But, um, I don't think so. Because this is not, this does, this subsystem, this circus car does not have, okay, uh, an exponential lifetime. Doesn't it kind of look like a circus car? This is, this is a train. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. This is, I'm old fashioned, I <laughs> think old fashioned wise. This is um, subsystem lifetime. So we've got that, that's exponential with rate 2 lambda. This is uh, exponential with rate lambda here. Now I need the maximum of two things. So what is the two? So what is this? This is the probability that the maximum of T1 and T2 is less than or equal to Z. Um, where this was exponential of rate uh, lambda, and this is exponential of rate 2 lambda. They get the, the uh, yeah. And they're independent. Okay. So, I mean, this is not that easy of a problem. Okay. Just to get this F2. So now, uh, what do you do? Now you say, now what's the trick? The maximum is less equal to Z. It's not that easy to work out, but the maximum greater than z is easy to work out. So this is 1 minus the probability that the maximum of t1 and t2 is greater than z. But the maximum is bigger, the maximum of two things is bigger than z, if and only if each one of them individually is bigger than z. So this is 1 minus the probability that t1 bigger than Z and T2 bigger than Z, T1 and T2 are independent because the components don't overlap. I'm making sure not to make anything overlap here. What? Both of them. Yeah, both of them have to be bigger than Z. The max is bigger than Z if precisely when both of them are bigger than Z. I thought only one of them had to be bigger than Z. Uh, That's right. I got this wrong. You're right. I did this one right. I got this one wrong. Good. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't have to change this one. Oh, okay. So I I messed up. You're right. Excellent. Absolutely. See, here I use bigger than Z for the minimum, and that worked out. Okay, and I need less. This one I don't need to change. Okay. This is precisely, the maximum is less than equal to Z. Let's correct that precisely when both of them are less than equal to Z. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good catch. So this is uh, T1 less than equal to Z. T2 less frequently. At least your ears were working. <laughs> maybe, or maybe it was your eyes. <laughs> so that is just a product. So that is just now. I have to put an X. I have to put the distribution functions in now. This is uh, probability of T1 less frequently. Is it light in here? Yes, it is. Times the probability of T2 less frequently. Is got a little leak in the room. Okay. Yeah, that was one of those aliens up there. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> Okay, so T one was exponential rate lambda, T two was exponential rate two lambda, so this is one minus e to the minus two lambda Z. One minus e to the Minus lambda, oh, excuse me, I'm not going to put the right order. Lambda z, 1 minus e to the minus 2 lambda z. Okay? And so there's a distribution function of two. Now see if we can put the whole thing together. So now I have to take the minimum of two things, so I have to use the survival probability again. Okay? 
think would be the best way to do it. So, uh, so now, what's the, what's the, so what I'm going to do is now calculate the probability uh, that the minimum of Z1 and Z2 is less than or equal. Well, if I put bigger than Z, then I multiply. If I put less than or equal to Z, then I have, then I have to change it this time. So now I will change it. Okay? Because now the lifetime of the system is the minimum of these two. Like the Z1 is kind of a, a bad thing here. Right? It's kind of, it, by, by it breaking, the whole thing breaks. So this is the system distribution function. System CDF. Okay? Capital, I don't know what you want to call it now. Um, yeah. Yeah. That works. Okay. System. Lifetime. Okay. The minimum must be equal to Z, and so that becomes the probability. Now, one minus the probability that the minimum is bigger than Z. So here I do use the, 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 the complementation, right? Because I want the, the survival probability is the one to work with the minimum. Okay? But, yeah. So now the mass of probability, that's one minus the probability that Z1 bigger than Z, times the probability that Z2 bigger than Z. Now I have to get these. Now Z2, but Z1 bigger than Z, I have that written down already or whatever. That's just e to the minus lambda Z, the survival probability for a single exponential. Yeah. Why do you switch them? Because I have the minimum here. Yeah. So, so I have the maximum, I don't need to switch it. But when I have the minimum, I can calculate the probability the minimum is bigger than Z. The minimum of two numbers, if I have eight oh. and seven is the two numbers, oh, okay. the minimum is bigger than okay. Z. Minimum of eight and seven is bigger than Z. Um, both has to be bigger than Z. Both has to be bigger than Z. Because um, Z is seven and a half, it's not true, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, so they both have to be bigger than Z. Okay. So then, this is one minus, this is just e to the minus lambda z now. This survival probability. And this one I have to subtract this from one times one minus one minus e to the minus lambda z. One minus e to the minus two lambda z. This is all you need for your test problem. You just need to get this expression, right? And differentiate it. Right. And this I have to put all this junk in. Oh. Okay. And now I'll differentiate that after expanding it. That would give me the density. So therefore, f subsystem lifetime, a little f of z equals d by dz, capital F of system lifetime. Equals derivative of this whole mess here. But I have to expand it all out. This is a sum of, this is, let's see, a sum of two exponentials minus a third one. Right? So then you, this is d by dz of 1 minus e to the minus lambda z times, let's see, e to the minus lambda z plus e to the minus 2 lambda z minus e to the minus 3 lambda z. Put all these together, but that's going to be easy to differentiate. So this is going to be put all these together before I differentiate d by dz. One minus e to the minus two lambda z minus e to the minus three lambda z plus e to the minus four lambda z. So when I differentiate now, I'm going to get this equal to two e to the minus two lambda z plus three e to the minus three lambda. Minus four e to the minus four lambda z. And that's supposed to be a density. So the two lambda 
This is, if I integrate this from 0 to infinity in z, I get 2. To me, I get uh, 1 plus 1 minus 1. Okay. Just 1. Wow. Go check it is. So it's hard, you know, this would be a lengthy problem to put anything that complicated on the exam. And that's how you could uh, do it. You have to somehow figure out what all the exponentials are. Use all these min-max tricks. Okay, and decide whether so I would flip it or not flip it. Okay. So you can see how I'm just about missing a lot of board space by flipping it when I wasn't supposed to. Thanks for the catch. Okay? So this is the ultimate usage of the tricks, okay? It's easy to deal with the min bigger than z and max less than z, okay? As long as there are any kind of components or subsystems. And then you use the fact that this, the minimum of some independent exponentials is exponential with the sum of the rates. Questions about this homework or statistics and all that stuff? Everybody's fed up with it. I'm not going to ask you order statistics. It was on the test. It's, it's giving too much trouble at this point, I think. Um, I could have skipped it, but um, there was at least one criticism of the, of the text saying, well, he, he puts this you know, heavyweight stuff in there and gives it one paragraph and then says goodbye. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. The, the text is very, very, very rich in examples. And there simply is space to give, you know, full shrift, so to speak, to each of those examples. Uh, I'm not even covering half the examples. Um, but I chose to pick on the order statistics a little bit to finish up this whole discussion of density and distribution function and so on. And now you've been fully versed in densities, I believe. I think it'll be a good uh, base for what we're going to do next. <clears throat> so why don't we uh, continue? Are there questions about the practice exam? About any other homework problems or anything? Okay, I guess just going to expect to value that. I had some notes, eight, that I think I'll go through. And um, just copy notes eight. And I also have some notes nine. I'm about to turn them out. I don't know how if I'm going to get there or not today. Um, but this is going to be the basis of your first. These notes eight and nine will be the homework that's going to be due in two weeks. So we, we gave the intuitive, well, the motivation for the definition of expected value. And now I think I want to do an expected value for the geometric graph curve. This author is going to first deal with uh, the discrete case and calculate expected values for the discrete case. So let x. This some of this is going to help you a little bit on the practice exam because we have to deal with geometric series. <laughs> What's a geometric series? Let x be a geometric random variable with parameter p. What's the probability mass function or so-called frequency function? P of x, probability the frequency function, the probability of capital X equals little x for this discrete random variable. Let's see. I guess you'd have to memorize that too, wouldn't you? 
Okay, you're going to get one head. Okay, that's the P. Then you're going to get x minus one. Maybe I should put it PK. I think maybe I would put PK. That's what he does in here. Because we're dealing with discrete, you know, make it a discrete parameter. One minus P to the K times P. K goes from one, two, three, and so on. Yeah, maybe a little, hopefully that won't be too much cramming. You have to know the binomial of the Poisson, the geometric, the exponential. Did I put any Poisson on there? No. Uh, well, maybe I'm using the Poisson. <laughs> but I put the geometric on. Okay. I didn't put any binomial either. You should know the binomial just in case I change one of the problems. Okay. <laughs> Binomial, geometric, and exponential. <laughs> All right, I'll stay with the song today. So there it is. There's the frequency function. What I want to find the expected value. What's the expected value of x? The expected value of x is summation over k. The value of the random variable, which is k, times the probability, P of the K. K goes from 1 to infinity. So that would be, if I write that down, the summation K times 1 minus P to the K minus 1 times P. K goes from 1 to infinity. Now, one thing to try to make this look a little easier is to put in um, Q in place of 1 minus P, so that's all the substitution that gets used. Let Q be the complementary parameter, Q equals 1 minus P. And this is written as summation K, Q to the K times P. And I can actually pull the P outside, because that doesn't have anything to do with K. K goes from 1 to infinity. And I've got that series to compute. I can write that out longhand. Sometimes it's better. I recommend writing out series longhand if you're uh, in general, to get an idea of what's going on. This is 1 times q plus 2 times q squared plus 3 times q cubed plus and so on. Now the question is, can I sum that infinite series? One, is it summable? That's the question of whether the uh, Expectation exists or not. In other words, sum will mean that there's actually a limit. Okay, a finite limit. So everything's positive here. So do these partial sums increase without boundary? Do they have a limit? They have a limit because q is less than one. Well, yeah. So then that's an exponential rate of decay, and then you have just this linear increase in coefficient. So all right, so that's a good enough analysis for for us. In other words, if I, I could do an integral test, right? I could do an integral test, basically. Um, with the, uh, the Q of the X, Q of the X, DX, okay? I'd have to write that as uh, Q of the X. I'd have to write that E to the minus log Q of X. E to the log Q of X would be X. Log Q X. You know, log Q is, is uh, log Q is a negative number, so that's e to the minus a x basically. Okay, that would be the integral test. This series. Of course, you would have to know actually that these terms are decreasing eventually in order to apply the integral test, but you could have well, it's easier to just do a ratio test. It's easier to do a ratio test. So you can test it. So let's not get into that. Not two again. Okay. A log q is a negative. Q is between zero and one, so the natural log q would be either log, q is either log q, right? This would be how our field of log not doing an integral test or something. Nobody ever does that with such theories, right? They always use a ratio test for these geometric weight series. But just in case you're thinking. So this one converges.
Okay. So let's just pretend that we did a little scratching on our heads and we said, okay, that's settleable. Okay, so no problem. So how do I actually comp is it computable? Can I actually get it in closed form? Or do I have to leave it like this? I'm done. I just say it's settleable and the expectation exists. I'm done. What do you think? I mean if I toss if I have a fair coin, or let's say the coin's not fair, let's say the coin has a probability of P equals 0.1 of coming up heads. How many times on average do you think I have to toss the coin in order to get a heads? That's what I'm doing. I'm, just, I'm waiting until I get my first heads here, right? How many times do I have to toss the coin on average to get my first heads? Nine, ten. Ten. One over point one, right? I'm done. That's the answer. Now just show it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so your intuition is correct. <laughs> All right. Now just prove it. So the expectation is going to be proved to be one over p. Doesn't mean that you know you'll get a heads on. You know you might get a heads on the very first toss, or on the you have to wait till the twentieth toss. But on average, you can also look at the tenth toss, like with people put more. So how do I get that? Well, one way is to take this and say treat it as a power series. Q is the variable. See that looks a lot like. Well, I could just pull another Q out and make that a k minus one here. And this would be the derivative of q to the k. So that's how you deal with these, these uh, this k going in front of the q to the k. And then I'll, that, in other words, I'll take the derivative of the geometric series. That's how the author does it. I'm going to show a little bit different way though, because I want to show something else. So one way to deal with it is to differentiate a power series term by term, which is also something you didn't count to. Nancy count to. Okay. As long as the uh, it was a power series in a convergent one, you can actually do that. That's legal. That's one of the theorems you can to. Okay. So that's the author differentiates a series. Differentiates the series Q K goes from uh, one to well, actually you go K goes from zero to infinity Q to the K. Because the actual uh, to get the answer differentiates this. Uh, this series, this series, what is the geometric series? If I go from zero to infinity, this is one plus q plus q squared. This is the geometric series. If I differentiate the ge geometric series, what do I get? Well, I have to know. pretty much what I have there. I'm not quite so that multiplied by Q, so I have to multiply by Q and then have to differentiate, right? If I do Q, so I would do uh, author does this, he does um, Q times D by D Q maybe, something like that. Okay? But you give me Q times D by D Q that give me q plus 2q squared plus 3q cubed and so on. Right? What is q d by dq of that thing? I mean, how, how, I mean, so I give you that expression, but what is q d by dq of this? Well, I have to be able to get a closed form of this in order to do that. What is the closed form of one of the geometric series? What's that? 1 plus q plus q squared. No. no. I need to know what this is. I need to sum one of these series that yeah, we don't. Oh, we have some. Um, isn't it that formula 1 minus? No. Isn't it some, it's not a sum of geometric series, is it? Yeah. yeah. That's a sum of geometric series. That is a geometric series. This is a geometric series. Yeah. That is not a geometric series. Yeah. This one is. But how do we get that? How do we get that this is equal to that? No, like, how did you get? How did I do it? I mean, just well, all we're doing is what happened to the k? Okay. So you okay? This is what I'm saying. The series. Okay, the k is if the k. If I differentiate this term and term, the k will come down. Yeah. The k will come down. I'll get a k q to the k minus one. This q will bring the k back up. Uh huh. Here. Yeah. All right. Uh huh. So you see that this is the correct expression for for this series. 
Q yeah. to the K. Uh -huh. All right. One over one minus Q. One, yeah, one. If I start with one, a plus a r plus a r squared plus so on equals a plus one minus r. Let everybody remember that. Uh, okay. Isn't that good stuff? I thought it was one. I thought it was one minus. The way I always remember is just one plus r plus r squared plus so on. Always start with one. Okay. Because you can always pull the first term out. This is a times one plus r plus r squared plus so on. That's the basic geometry series. Start with one. Common ratio r. That's 1 over 1 minus 1. Okay? As long as r is less than 1 and right? Okay? So that sum is just the derivative of 1 over 1 minus r multiplied by 1 over 1 minus q. Yeah, so this comes out to be q d by dq 1 minus q to the minus 1. I'll just set it up like that for differentiation. Which comes out to be equal to q minus 1, 1 minus q to the minus 2 times minus another minus 1 for the derivative of the chain rule, the chain rule. This minus 1 was the exponent. And this minus 1 is the derivative of minus q. So these two minus 1's cancel, and I get q over 1 minus q squared. So there are some other series that can be summed besides the geometric. And this is one of them. Okay. And there are some more. Right? But they're all very closely related to the geometric series. <laughs> so so then I get to this, so which is q over p squared. Inside the radius of convergence, we can differentiate term by term. Get the right answer. Okay. <laughs> it's legal to do that. But you can interchange the infinite sum of the derivative. Huh. Only if they converge. Yeah, inside the radius of convergence, a uh, power series. Okay. Remember that? You have something like this a k x to the k. k goes from 1 to uh, 0 to infinity. Right? Okay. Just a zero plus a one x plus a two x uh -huh. squared plus and so on. Okay. Uh -huh. That's what's a power series oh. in a real variable x. And what you have is that there's um, there's a radius of convergence. There's actually a formula for the radius of convergence in terms of the coefficients. I neglected to write it down. I'm okay. Um, and but there is a radius of convergence r equals the maximum absolute value of x. I'll just write this formula such that summation a0 at, uh, actually uh, a0 x is a, a k x to the k k goes from 1 to infinity uh, convergence 
Okay, that's the radius of convergence. So if 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 this series converges even, okay, just converges. Period. Okay, without actually value signs or anything, just converges. Not even absolute convergence. Okay, then. Um, Smaller x than actually converges absolutely in everything. Else. Okay. okay. Because a k x to the k has to go to zero. This convergence. This term has to go to zero. So we take a little bit smaller x. Just a little tiny bit smaller. Because because of the power here, then then the term that I would get is exponentially small. This is bounded. It's all I'm going to use. Like this goes to zero because it's bounded. If we take a little bit smaller x, this term itself well, will be exponentially small. And x is just a little bit smaller than r, so actually this converges absolutely beautifully. Okay, with absolute signs everywhere. We take a little bit x less than r. Okay? So that everybody converges inside an interval, which I mean all converges inside an interval, and and that's the most it converge. Okay? Pretty much just the endpoints is the question. In power series. Then you differentiate term by term inside that radius. Okay. So there's a nice function of x inside that radius of convergence. <clears throat> right. Term by term differentiation. Get one over p squared for the sum. So then this becomes equal to p times one over p squared equals one over p. So that's the Authors approach to this problem. Learn we call it out too. Okay. Alright. What's another approach to this problem that's a little bit more tricky but a little bit more interesting maybe? Okay? And that's this, another approach. And this has this is the approach that's hinted at in problem four point eight. There's some hard problems in there in this section before, and I've skipped most of them, but I'm going to show this one. Um, and that is, if I want to calculate um, this thing, that's, I want to calculate uh, calculate uh, the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1, that's p of 1 plus p of 2 plus p of 3 plus blah, 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 okay? Probably that x is greater than or equal to 2 is p of 2 plus p of 3 plus blah, blah, blah. Probably that x greater than or equal to 3 is p of 3 plus and so on, okay, like that. And so I keep going like this. I just noticed that. Why is that any good? Well, because if I add the columns, yeah, it's kind of an upper triangular business, all right? If I add the columns of this matrix, then what do I get? I get P of 1, 2P of 2, plus 3P of 3, etc., which is exactly what I want. and so on. Now the question is, can I add up this side? Alright? So that means that the sum, probably capital X greater than or equal to K, uh, K, K goes from 1 to infinity, is equal to that. My expectation. Now, can I sum this series? Well, what's the probability that the geometric random variable is greater or equal to K? Means first heads comes after k, or add k or after. It means precisely that the first k minus one results are tails. That's the easy way to sum because these are actually geometric series, right? I have to sum a geometric series each time, but actually each of these geometric series is easy to compute by regarding the fact that uh, 
the expert angle of three means heads on the third trial or after. That means just exactly that the first two tosses are heads. Then heads has to come the third time or after, all right? Assuming that heads is going to come eventually. <laughs> okay. All right. So this just becomes one minus p squared. This is one minus p. Well, this is q squared, q, and one. One q and q squared. So this just comes out to be equal to. This side comes out to be equal to one plus q plus q squared, and so on. So this side, okay. That side, the left side comes out to be that. Did everybody see that? See that? You could do it the long way. The long way is to go ahead and compute each of those geometric series. Right? P of 1 plus P of 2 plus P of 3. Well, that should be 1, right? That's to check that the actual geometric series frequency function is a frequency function. Okay, this would be summation uh, Q to the K minus 1 times P, K goes from 1 to infinity, should be equal to P times 1 plus Q plus Q squared plus and so on. P over 1 minus Q, which is P over P, which is 1. All right? So indeed, it does check out that that is a frequency function, right? Okay. Okay. Using the 1 minus Q is P. Using the flipping thing. 1 minus Q is P. 1 minus P is Q. So that comes out. And then if I did a P of 2 plus and so on, P of 2 plus P of 3. Maybe you want to see this with P of 4. This summation k goes from 2 to infinity q to the k minus 1 times p. So I'm just I'm summing the probability of 2. And then that comes out to be, um, let's see, that's p. Let's write it out long end. p times q plus q squared plus q cubed plus and so on, which is, I pull out a factor of q. That's what I always do with the geometric series. Did the camera see that alien? I don't know. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> PQ times 1 plus Q squared plus so on. 1 plus Q plus Q squared equals PQ 1 over 1 minus Q again, which is Q P P over P, which is 1. So it's, excuse me, Q, which is Q. So in other words, if you had to do it this way, you'd be all night long. <laughs> but the trick was to say this is exactly one tail first. First tosses were tails. This is the first two tosses were tails. And so on. So that's how I get it easily. Okay? Well, that's just 1 over 1 minus Q again equals 1 over P. You get 1 minus. How did you get that? This again? That's the sum of the geometric series. From what? The 1 plus Q plus Q squared. Oh. Yeah, I'm doing this now. So I'll just focus over here. I said change the focus over to here now. Okay? Okay. So that was the, another way to do it. And actually, this gives a general formula for any uh, positive integer value random variable that the expectation is the sum of these probabilities. generalization of that, um, well not a generalization, but there's an analog of that for the, the continuous case, which is written out in uh, a later homework problem. Indeed, in problem number 13, they've got yet another, the same basic idea, continuous version. I'm not going to cover that. It's, you rarely use this formula, but it's sometimes okay, occasionally said rarely and occasionally, well, somewhere in there. <laughs> okay, so that's all about remembering geometric sums. That's one of the few sums that you can actually do. Another one was the exponential series. You can actually sum that one, right? That's how we define the exponential. We define it in terms of the nice significant series. Remember that? Uh, 1 plus a plus a squared over 2 factorial plus a cubed over 3 factorial. And there's a few other special functions. 
Yeah, that's the Taylor series for e to the a. Right? Remember that good stuff? There's a few. The geometric series and the exponential series. Those are the ones. And usually, in engineering subjects, we ask you to know the sign, the cult sign, maybe since cosh too. But <laughs> I guess you have to remember. You know, you probably don't remember all the stuff because you know you can run to a table of series and find that stuff. But the, for the for for any other math class, well, you have to know the exponential series and the geometric series. Okay. And I think I'm just for this test. You might have to know the geometric series. I'm not going to make you know the exponential series for this test. Okay. For the first test. For the first test. Yeah. But then that would give you the expectation of the Poisson. How would you do, if I know this series, maybe I can uh, get the expectation of the Poisson random variable. So let x be Poisson with parameter lambda. Now, I'll recall for you the frequency function. The frequency function is p of k is e to the minus lambda, lambda to the k over k factorial. This time k goes from 0 to 1, 2. So the Poisson variable value zero. Yeah, this sums up to e to the minus lambda times e to the lambda, which is one. So you can see the frequency function adds up to one. What's the expectation? Frequency function adds up to one. Yeah, but what is the what happens when I multiply the frequency function by k and then sum? That's the expectation. But the value of x, in other words, it is uh, summation k p of k. A goes from 0 to infinity equals k. I can pull the e to the minus lambda out, that's a constant. k lambda to the k, k factorial. So k goes from 0 to infinity. Maybe I should write that out longhand. I always write it out longhand. I should write it down in this form. So e to the minus lambda, 0, lambda to the 0 over 0 factorial, plus 1 lambda to one, one factorial plus two, lambda to two. That's just the derivative of the, what do you call it, e to the a sum. Boom. Isn't it? No? Okay. So on the bottom, isn't it just k minus So you're saying it's a derivative of something? It looks like a derivative of something, because you have that one, two, multiplied by the drum of e to the lambda is e to the lambda. So, yeah. um, so wouldn't there be like lambda? So maybe we don't even need to use a derivative if that's the case. What happens if, okay, so let's say, um, let's see, so where would the two come in? So I'd have to get rid of another, I'd have to pull a lambda out in order to make this two lambda, right? That's going to be the derivative of lambda squared, right? Oh. So let pull a lambda out. Yeah, you're pulling it. Well, yeah, then they k minus 1 because now the bottom is k minus 1. And now we're e to the minus sign. Oh, he's seen the factorial canceling. Yeah, because it's k minus 1 hex. 0 plus 1 over 1 factorial plus 2 over 2 factorial lambda plus 3 over 3 factorial lambda squared. So, okay? If you cancel the 2 with the 2 factorial, you get 1 factorial, 2 factorial, and so on. So you simply get lambda k over k factorial. The first time, how, how did you pull a lambda out of that? I was just 0. Probably not 0. Yeah, if it was 0, I could just get rid of it. So I'm just getting rid of this. Okay, just get rid of it. Zero here to emphasize. I got rid of it, but now we're zero to there. Okay? Yeah. So it's lambda, the answer. Yes. Because on this side, you just use uh, lambda as e a on that. Yeah, lambda e to minus lambda. E to minus times one plus lambda over one factorial plus lambda squared over two factorial. I have to cancel the uh -huh. So here's 
can't see the factorial, a 3 by 3 factorial is 1 over 2 factorial. Which is usually a lambda again. Or you can use it, I mean, basically, you don't have to bring in the derivative because the derivative of the lambda is even a lambda. <laughs> okay. So you, both of you saw that you could do that. And uh, so lambda, e to the minus lambda, e to the lambda equals lambda. That's what you want. Uh, that's what you, well, maybe you didn't remember that. But in the binomial case, n, the, how many coins do you expect to come up heads if you toss n coins with probability p of heads each time you expect? n p heads. You expect lambda heads. That means you expect lambda rare events on average. Okay. So that is mean, okay, and well, then to do the binomial though, we want some more, we want some theorems. Um, so now we we're able to calculate these. What about the binomial? We expect it to be mean to be NP. We expect it, but we haven't proved it. And that's a little bit harder computation. If I put down the, that business uh, and try to write it out, there's no derivative rule that's going to help me, unfortunately. Um, well, you might be able to figure something out. So, I see I have a lot of other stuff to do here before I get to the rules. I spent a couple more weeks on this. Um, well, maybe I should say what a fair game is. Yeah, I mentioned this uh, so what are we gambling doing? paradox. I'm going to follow these notes. Notes 8, page 3, the bottom. So what's a fair game? I think instead of forging ahead, I'm going to give a little bit more filling in here since we have, to, we have a little bit more time. Um, Day. We're not that much time today. We started trying to get it all to the rules. Um, you've seen all the rules anyway. They expect, uh, math 381, you'd expect to value the sums of some expected values. That kind of stuff. Yeah. The, the expected value is a linear operation. And you've seen all the rules before. So maybe I'll do some of the things you probably hadn't seen. Fair game. What's a fair game? A fair game is a game of which expected winnings is zero. Okay, so what's an example? If the game is a place of bet, place of bet. Heads. Balance coin means probably 50 50 for heads. All right? Comes up heads with payoff amount equal to the bet. So if you win, is everybody clear? If you, you put your A dollar or A down, and you bet, so let's say heads is going to come up. And if heads doesn't come up, they take the bet, okay? You lose. Otherwise, uh, if heads does come up, they put that amount on top of yours and you take it back, right? So what does that mean? Very boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of boring. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Exactly, that's the way they play blackjack, right? They just they just give fund you the amount of the bet, right? Blackjack, blackjack. Is that fair? That's not fair. I don't think so. Because the house 
kids to know if you're here, you bust or not. Or, you know, so the house has to be big event. So let's go ahead. The, the winnings. <laughs> Look at that work out. I could write a thesis about it. The winnings, or you can go to Las Vegas and do an applied thesis. So the winnings X is represented by, let's just get this, I just want to get this jargon down. X is equal to minus A, lose the bet, with probability one half, and plus A. Uh, win A on top of your bet this was supposed to be probability one half. I don't want anybody to be confused as to what's actually mechanically happening. Uh, you get your bet back and then they give you another A. So that's exactly what happens in black check, right? What? Oh, you lose A? Yeah. You, you, lose, you lose your bet, they take your bet, or keep your bet and they put another one next to it. So now, with that little simple blackjack scheme, um, well, it's calculated the expected value of x. The expected value of x, therefore, is equal to minus a times one half plus a times one half equal to zero. So that's a fair game. But now, some brilliant person came up and said, "Well, suppose I do the following: if I lose, I double my bet. Right? They took my bet. Okay, I'll put twice what they." You know what I started with. I'll put, sorry, let's say I start with one dollar. Okay, and I lose. They, they, so now I went dollar down. Well, okay, but I have a, a lot of money over here. That's a free count. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just take a whole bunch of money with me. And I'll put two dollars down now. Okay. And um, you lose again. Let's say you lose again. So I put two and I put four dollars down. Now you win. Let's say you win. Now you've made one dollar because you lost three, but you made one. Mm -hmm. You made four. Okay? So it couldn't be that you if you use this double or nothing scheme, you would always win one dollar. You have a lot of money. Okay. You have to have a lot of money? Yeah. Because I mean keep doubling. Yeah, yeah so you might lose ten times in a row. If you lose ten times in a row, you're broke. Then you have to have a thousand dollars. What if you win twenty times in a row? <laughs> okay, so can you win a dollar? Okay. Well, that's the question. Um, so let P be the amount of money that she must bet on the time that she wins, starting with the bet of one in the first game. Okay. So let's say the gambler is, I'll just use the pronoun she because that's very much a vote these days, right? So let's say she, and plus she's going to have a purse, all right? <laughs> okay, so let P denote the amount of money she must bet on the time that she wins. Let P, so on the time that she wins, let P equal, that's a random number, right? P equal the amount of money, that's the how big the purse is going to be, roughly, right? P, the amount of money that the gambler must bet in a double or nothing double doubling scheme on the time she wins. Okay, and so on the time she wins, you figure out okay, how much did you put down on the time that you won? That's the P. That's the random variable P. All right. That's how big the purse has to be. Next has to be twice that roughly because you were already lost the amount of pieces of the purse. Okay. Okay. And now you put this down. Okay. You already lost this amount. Roughly speaking, minus one dollar. Okay. Now you're going to put this in, because the rule is that 1 plus 2 plus 4, let's say you lost 3 times, mm -hmm. equals 7, which is 8 minus 1. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's the way you can actually work this out with geometric sums. This is true. So 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 equals 16 minus 1 and so on. 
Some of you maybe don't know that. Okay, 15 equals 16 minus 1. So the next time you're going to put 16 down. Okay, and then if you win, you will have won $1 total. Okay, you're going to get your dollar. Okay, <laughs> by this method. I'm going to get my dollar, and then after I get my dollar, then I can start all over again, right? Okay, so I'll become a millionaire. Okay, <laughs> as long as it's a fair game. Okay, what's wrong with this? So you double until you win, and then you start over on one dollar. Is that the deal? Or? Yeah, you can double until you win, and then you've got one dollar more than your original purse, right? Yeah, and then you lose all your money, and then you can't make a bet. Okay, then you steal it again. Just keep doing it. You keep winning one dollar. Why not? What's the problem? The purse has to be infinite. Is the problem? But the expected value of the purse is what? So how big can I do this? In other words, what's the expected value of P? Okay. Well, I would also bring in T is the time that she wins, right? T is the geometric variable. T equals the time, waiting time, time. Until she wins? Until she wins. So T is geometric. One half. Pair of coin and you flip it and take it heads. Now, so probability t equals k equals one half times one half to the k minus one. We just work that out with one half to the k. Alright? And of course, you know, the expected value of t, the expected value of t is two. You expect you win two times on average, but you might not win for a long time. Right, you might get a whole bunch of losses in a row. So now what's the, um, but what is, now what is P? What's the distribution of P? Capital P is equal to, it was one when K was equal to one. It was, it was two when K is equal to two. Excuse me, uh, when T is equal to one. When T is equal to two, it's four when T equals to three. A when t is equal to 4, etc. So, with, with this probability, with, and therefore with probability, therefore 1 half to the uh, 1, with probability 1 half squared, with probability 1 half, this is the probability of my random variable, 1 half cubed, and so on. It's just a geometric probabilities, but also geometric values with the other way. So therefore, P equals 1, 2, 4, and 8, with probabilities 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, and so on. Okay? And so therefore, the expected value of P is the value times the probability equals 1 times a half plus 2 times 4 plus 4 times an eighth plus 8 times a sixteenth plus and so on. Okay, that's one half plus one half plus one half plus one half plus one half equals infinity. So if you have infinitely much money, then you can then you can win <laughs> this with this game. Okay? As long as you wait long enough. As long as you also might have that infinite time to make the main dollars. Okay. <laughs> Towards well, you can still get this as infinite. infinite. 
okay? I mean, you, you, you're still getting this identity. Okay? So that, that part of the, um, I mean, this arithmetic doesn't change. This arithmetic doesn't change. This will still be infinite, okay? But the probability changes, so it'll be one times. Yeah, certainly the probabilities will change. Yeah, the probability. Now, the probability that um, if P is less than one from winning, is that what you want? So if you want the probability, so you want the probability Q with probability P here, P is the probability of winning if P is less than a half, P is less than a half, okay. And then this is, um, this is P Q to the K minus one. So this becomes P Q to the K, Q to the uh, zero. This PQ to the zero is becomes a PQ to the one and so on. PQ squared. There were three, or exponent three, but now I've got three letters, P's and Q's, right? Okay, that's the correspondence. Okay. So then you would uh, have uh, one times, I guess it would be a constant factor of one, and you get um, Q plus two. 1 plus 2q plus 4q squared, and so on. So the series would come up like this. Q is bigger than a half. Okay, so this is geometrically each of these. So this is Q is bigger than a half. So if I sub, uh, substitute it in, so 4q squared is 2q to the quantity squared. So I'm getting a geometric series where the ratio is bigger than 1. So this is blowing up. Okay. Rapidly. Okay. Oh, God. What's the point of the expression? You want to have it infinity. Yeah, well, the point is that you really can't, in other words, you can't function. Okay, in other words, you really can't win a million dollars this way. Okay. Practically speaking. So we could try to, we'll be further analysis in the case where it wasn't a fair game, would be interesting to think here, but even if it is a fair game, or this kind of boundary case. We can analyze black death. I do cold. So, in other words, something's got to, I mean, it seems fine. So the way to sort of talk about why this scheme doesn't work is to say the expected value of this person is infinite. That's kind of a nice way, I think, to summarize the problem. <coughs> okay? So there is such a thing as an uh, uh, the expected value doesn't exist. And the author says the expected value doesn't exist unless um, this is finite, this has to be finite, then expectation value of x exists, okay? And if it doesn't, if this isn't finite, then the expected value doesn't exist. Here, of course, if it's a positive random verb, you can talk about infinite expectation, which is my All right, I think we'll skip the rest for today and we'll talk about more about expectation next time. Okay? That's enough for today.